This is the latest machine from Bamboo Lab, the H2S. It's like the X1 Carbon went to the gym, got all swole, and this is the end result. It's an H2D with a single nozzle. And this entire package comes at a price of $1,249, which leads us to certain conclusions, which we'll talk about soon, because I've had some time with this machine and I wanna tell you about it. You're in 3D Printing Nerd Studios, probably powered by PCB Wave. 8% off, link in the description. You know what to do. The H2S arrived not that long ago, and when getting it out of the box, it felt familiar, and that's because this is an H2D case. There is a spot on the back where the second filament path should go, and they're just reusing that. There's no filament that goes in there. It's a single extruder. It was familiar getting it out of the box and getting the print going and everything just sort of worked. This is Bamboo Lab's largest build volume to date. It's 340 on X, 320 on Y, and 340 on Z or Z. They have a single extruder in the H2S and it's got a 0.4 millimeter hardened nozzle at the end of it so you can print all those crunchy materials. Just like the H2D, the nozzle goes up to 350C, the bed to 120C. It's an actively heated chamber and that'll go to 65C. According to the stats, it'll hit speeds of 1000 millimeters per second using 20K per second squared acceleration. If all of this sounds really familiar, it's because it's literally the stats of the H2D. In the time that I've had it, I've been able to print with PLA, PETG, PCTG, polycarbonate, and TPU. There are plans to print with higher temperature engineering grade materials, and that's meant for a follow-up. If you have a favorite engineering grade material that you'd like to see printed on this, leave that down below. So with PLA, of course, we started off with the Benchy. It's the benchmark print, and this print looks good, as it should. I also went a little larger with some carbon fiber PLA. This is a snack box, something that you can insert some trays and some bins into and then put it on your couch and snack away while you watch K-pop demon hunters. It's a great model and the print quality is fantastic. With that same carbon fiber PLA, I was able to print the Dummy 13 armor parts. Uh, they do recommend PLA for the armor and PETG for the frame. So the armor in carbon fiber PLA looks great. It printed in this orientation. I left the sprues on because I think it looks cool and I'm really happy with it. I also made something incredibly practical with that carbon fiber PLA and I can't show you in my hands because it's literally in my corporate bathroom. I actually filmed that for a video coming out on the channel, a quick, easy, fun, practical print, and it's a paper towel holder. Now let's talk about PETG, and I got a few prints done with that material. First was the Dummy 13 frame, and I love it. Like, it looks good. This is a blue PETG, and it really was able to, to print it well. I remember with the H2D, the original PETG prints I did before release were great. And then after release, a firmware update came out and there were issues printing with PETG. It would do false positives with buildup on the nozzle for some reason. Not great, Bob. I didn't have any of that experience with the H2S, so they must have figured it out in the firmware and the prints look really good. I was also on a snack box kick. And so I printed the body of that snack box in pet g and i painted on fuzzy skin fuzzy skin really gives a 3d print this this texture that makes it feel like a product i had some pctg from 3d fuel and i decided to throw that into the machine to see how well it could print it and this first off is the matte black pctg these are some boxes for the snack box. The sidewalls are amazing on this material. The, the matte black does have a little bit of carbon fiber in it to give it that matte sort of texture. PCTG being ductile, so you can, you, can, you can squish the box a little bit. I did have some print issues with the material. Uh, it might need to have a little bit of drying applied to it, or I'll talk to John about settings using this specific extruder. I don't know, I'm gonna keep working on that because I really like the material. It's not a fault of the machine. I think it's settings 
and testing. So I will, I will do that a little bit more. I also used the Midnight Black PCTG from 3D Fuel and it came out good too. Like this is amazing. I love this material. The more I print with it, the happier I am with it. Like this is to hold your drink and print it in PCTG and it's a print in place self-leveling drink holder for that snack box. For polycarbonate, I did what everybody wants to do with polycarbonate material. Let's say it at the same time. One, two, three, print a handbag. What? This is polycarbonate on the H2S and when you're printing with this material, the machine gets really hot and it's able to print it out really well. This polycarbonate handbag is phenomenal. Uh, it's really sturdy and it's, uh, it's not gonna be broken easily. I was also, I also printed the handles and then I went to my local hardware store and I found these keychains and I put it in here. It looks cool, it's unique, it's not something that everybody has. And I made this, how cool. Last up was TPU. And as you can see, I printed that same handbag but in a flexible material. So you can, you can flex it. This is the Fiberology FiberFlex 40D. So it's a squishy material. Uh, it does give a lot of flex, no problem. But I ran into an issue. So what's bothering you? So this is textured PEI that comes with the H2S. And I've printed flexibles on textured PEI before and usually it allows me to peel it off. This wasn't coming off easily. And on the website, it says heat the build plate to 110C to aid with removal. So I did that and I burnt my finger in the process. Ow, 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 shoot, because 110C is really friggin' hot, but it did make it slightly easier to remove, but I still had issues. So 110C was enough temperature to destabilize the material, and when pulling it away, it sort of separated because it was in a, not a melted state, but at 110C, I mean, we're getting close to the glass transition temperature. It still looks like this, but again, the quality is there. I think the quality in printing flexibles is there. TPU still feels like an afterthought with the way you have to do it. It has the TPU hole in the back that you feed PTFE through to plug into the nozzle, and then you put it on an external spool holder, or you take off the top and you hang it from above and go straight in and, you know. But when you do do that, you do get fantastic results. And I'm looking forward to doing more flexible 3D printing, and I have machines that can print it well, and now the H2S is added to that list. Printing TPU did come at a cost, both both personally and professionally, because I'm, I'm holding something here that I shouldn't be. So this is a broken filament sensor. And when I first tried to print TPU, I got a massive jam in the extruder. And I removed the nozzle to try to get to it, and I still couldn't get to it. So I had to take off this front cover to get to it. I was able to resolve the issue and it was great. And I put everything back together, but then I realized I'd put something in the wrong spot. Uh, so I took it apart again, went to reassemble it, and I broke the ribbon cable for the filament sensor. And I thought, no issue, no worries. I reached out to our Bamboo Lab representative and I let him know what happened. And he was able to ship one up. And so while I was waiting for that, I tried to print and you can't. If this sensor isn't working, the machine is down, but spare parts were close at hand. The spare parts that were sent to me came from California. And in looking at these parts, it's interesting. They are unique. So I checked the A1 series, the P1 series, and the X1 series, and even the H2 series that I had on hand to see if I could borrow the filament sensor from there to work in this. But this is unique. The filament sensor on the H2S is a brand new part. And I would imagine Bamboo Lab has already produced the spare parts to go into the stock. So people, if they have an issue like this, their machine isn't down for as long. The H2S also has the ability to carry the laser and the digital cutter and the pen plotting module that Bamboo introduced with the H2D. Now, just the 10 watt laser, not the 40 watt. And to do any of those, you do need to get the laser upgraded version of the H2S. And in doing so, it does have certain sensors for the laser, like flame sensors, and the inside of the machine is flame retardant. And there's also a big emergency shutoff switch. Same one that the H2D has, has it over here. 
Um, I wasn't sent any of those extra accessories. Bamboo likes to talk about this machine as a personal manufacturing hub in thinking that they're gonna make those accessories that they introduced with the H2D available as well. And just like with the H2D, the AMS2 Pro at the top can hold up to four materials. Uh, it can dry spools and monitor the moisture just, just like it has been able to. And you can hook up a bunch of AMS2 Pros just like the H2D. So when talking about the AMS, that actually raises issues that I wanna to talk to you about, the waste that this machine produces. So since Bamboo Lab introduced the AMS with the X1 Carbon long ago, nearly every 3D printer manufacturer has copied it and made their own version of the AMS. But there's no standard way to deal with the waste that's spit out the back of the machine. So the H2S can do multicolor 3D printing, and I didn't do any of it with this machine. I don't like multicolor 3D printing. I don't like the waste that it makes. And part of the reason for that, the manufacturer doesn't give us any way by default to deal with the waste. It just poops it out the back of the machine. And so if I could speak to Bamboo at this point, hi, Mr. Bamboo, it's good to meet you. I think it would be wonderful if Bamboo Lab gave us with the machines a way of dealing with the waste product that it produces. The AMS is good, this is the best version of it, but it is very wasteful. And we've seen tool changers such as the Prusa XL able to do multicolor 3D printing without as much waste. And now Bontec has the index system, which looks promising, and Snapmaker has broken Kickstarter records raising money for a U1 consumer-based tool changer 3D printer. And now it's time to be a leader again and introduce another technology that's built well that consumers can use. And I think the tool changer is it. Let me know if you think I'm correct or if I'm way off base. Obviously, I recorded that before the H2S came out. And with the H2S announcement, there was also this announcement of the Vortec. It's a Bamboo Lab tool changer. I guess they really do listen to me. <laughs> it looks neat. Have a look. We call it the Vortec Hot End Change System. It's one of the first induction heated, fully automated hot end swap solutions. Awesome! The H2S from Bamboo Lab, 1249. It is priced extremely well. And I'm really looking forward to seeing if this sells and what people think of it, and whether or not this has priced the X1 series out of existence. Well, this is my first look at the Bamboo Lab H2S. It's an H2D with a single nozzle. It's the X1 carbon that grew up. And I, I just, I like that this is the direction that they're going. I think this is a formidable machine in a very competitive market. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens. If you made it this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more, fight for a cause you believe in, and print all the things. And as always, High five.